Yo, 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 yo. What's up, wonderful people of the world? Thank you for tuning in to Let's Keep Talking. I hope you know I love you. I hope you know I hope you're having a great day. And I hope you know that I wish you the absolute best in whatever you're involved in in life. If you're tuning into this episode, that means you want to know about personality types and more particularly the Myers Briggs personality type, the Myers Briggs uh, personality assessment of sorts. Well, lucky for you, I have my friend Caitlin Hawkett here to talk all about that. That's what she does. That's who she is. She's a, uh, a Myers Briggs type indicator practitioner. A certified practitioner and I think this is a really helpful conversation because it allows us to feel validated in the ways that we relate to the world and to others and also have space for other people who relate to the world and to themselves and to us in a way that might be different than us. So without further ado, let's hop into today's episode with Caitlin Hawkett. Let's just start off with um, a general understanding for the audience of what the Myers-Briggs assessment is and how it's useful. Yeah. So, um, so it's a personality assessment and the theory is that there are, um, ways in which we engage with the world that are either focused more inwardly or outwardly. Um, and these have to do with how we take in information and how we process that information. So, um, anyone who's ever taken an assessment, whether it was the official Myers-Briggs tape indicator or whether it was one of the many, many free ones available online, um, they've probably gotten a, what is called a four letter type code. Um, so I'll break down what the four letter type code is made up of. So it's basically four pairings of eight different things. So the first one is introversion and extroversion. Um, so it's indicated by an I or an E in your four letter type code that you get as a result. So that one is kind of like where you, what you pay attention to in the world, where you focus your energy. Um, So do you tend to focus Mm. it more on the world around you and looking outward and pulling things in from out there? Or do you pull in from within yourself? Do you like to spend time reflecting and and turning inward more? And we all like Mm. to do both of these things. Oh, go ahead. Sorry to ask you, is that also, is that kind of how you regulate your mood too is, is by paying attention externally or internally? Um, yeah, I would say it's um, about regulating your energy, which yes, would obviously probably be directly reflected in your mood. So if you're not feeling super energized, your mood's probably not going to be great. And if you're feeling more energized, you're gonna be in a better mood, right? So um, people Mm -hmm. with the extroversion preference tend to get really energized by interacting with other people. And people with the Mm -hmm. introversion uh, preference tend to get a little more drained by it. So it's sort of like, um, in a simplistic way, The other letters add more nuance to that, but in a simplistic way, it's like, oh, if you have a preference for extroversion, your tank might start out empty at the beginning of the day. And then as you interact with people, it gets fuller. And if you have the introversion preference, your tank might start out full and kind of get drained throughout the day in all your interactions with people, even if you're enjoying them, it can still pull from your energy. Right. So um, right off. Yeah. Right off the bat. Sorry to sorry to pump the brakes real quick, but I I just the. uh, it, it, that first like separation of people, like some people get really energized by being around others and some people don't, uh, mm-hmm. just drawing that clear distinction with something like this can help us feel more validated in the way that we respond to other people and to big groups and to social events. And also make sure we respect other people whenever they go like, I need some alone time. And instead of going, what the fuck you weirdo? We can go mm-hmm. like, okay, that makes sense. Maybe you're someone who, who gets energy from a little bit more of that solo time. Absolutely. I always say, because whenever I would do a workshop about these things or um, go over somebody's assessment results with them, I always say, you know, it's a lot to take in. And for me, it's a win if somebody even just walks away with an aha moment about any one of the aspects of this assessment. And so I think Mm -hmm. if you only walked away with one, I think a really powerful one is what energizes me may not be the same as what energizes someone else. And like you said, having mutual respect there, um, because especially in the workplace where I do a lot of these workshops, um, somebody with a preference for extroversion might ask a, a colleague who has a preference for introversion, oh, do you want to go to lunch with all of us today? And if they say no, they might take it as, oh, they don't like me. They don't want to hang out with us. Uh. But maybe the colleague just has had so many meetings that day and they're j- they just really need to kind of refuel over their lunch break and have some time to themselves. And so it's nothing personal necessarily, you know, so having that awareness. Yeah, the, 
there's a spiritual practice of don't take things personally or emotional mm -hmm. practice, you might want to call it that, or mental health practice. Don't take mm -hmm. things personally. People say things, people do things, and nine out of 10 times, it's not about you. It's just the way they've learned to organize their life in the way that's best for them. And, yep. uh, you know, that's a great example. Like, do you want to hang out? And they're like, no. And you're like, well, fuck you. You know, like, well, fine, <laughs> if you want to hang out, well, then you can die, you know? But in reality, right. the person die, might be like, hey, I've worked hard all day like you have. And after a long day, I like to sink into a bubble bath by myself away from people and you're the opposite yes. and that's okay yes yeah and and sometimes they can feel bad because it doesn't mean they don't the person with the preference for introversion it doesn't mean that they don't really value those relationships and they don't want to make anyone feel bad but they know that for them to be operating at their best level for the rest of the afternoon they're going to need that that downtime hmm. um so are those can, people are those people just more are those people how do you socialize well with an introvert <laughs> So here's a, like introverts really, they, many, many, many of them really enjoy socializing. Um, it tends to mm. be though that they might be, um, they might feel most energized by their closest relationships. So um, mm. maybe they, you might get an introvert alone and they, you have a good relationship with them and they might talk, talk a ton for hours. It doesn't necessarily mean they're not talkative or, or um, sociable. It just means that it kind of has a different effect on them. And they, they really um, have to closely guard the way that they expend the energy that they have to give. Um, and so mm. when they are, they, it's, it's not as if they're not enjoying um, those socializing moments. It's just that they're going to have maybe a different, um, a different way of processing them at the time that's going to leave them feeling different after. So it might totally be worth it to them. Like, Hey, I know I'm going to go out tonight and it's going to totally drain me, but I'm going to have fun while I'm doing it. Um, yeah. and so, yeah. so and definitely they have that there. Yeah. Really awesome. The first letter I or E introvert extrovert. Yeah. Next letter. Um, we got three so more, right? One, yeah. There are three more pairs. So the next one is intuition and sensing. So the, the letters for that are going to be mm. S for sensing N for intuition only because the I was already taken by introversion in the first pairing. So that one can get a little confusing, but that's the only one that's like that. Mm. Um, so sensing and intuition. So this is the kind of information you tend to pay attention to. Um, mm. So this is, are you taking in information? If you have a sensing preference, you're focusing on your five senses and you're noticing detail and you're noticing um, you know, things that are measurable, quantifiable, and you also tend to have a really good sense of what is like, what is reality? Like in objectivity. This yes. Yeah. It's just very, um, yeah. What, what is intuition is a more, um, like a big picture way of looking at things kind of theoretical. Um, they tend to focus more on what could be, uh, so they might look mm. at a situation and, what could be may feel very real to them because it feels like, yeah, we're on the way. It's, it's getting there. This is the possibility for this thing or for this person. Um, so it can be, it can be challenging. Uh, again, when you have people with opposite preferences, um, they're paying attention to different things, but when you think about it, um, it's really helpful to have people who are focusing on the smaller picture details and people focusing on the bigger picture. What could be, where could this go? Because when they're paired together, they make things happen. Is that like, is that the, would, with you, with your perspective on this and your experience in it, would you, would you label those people kind of like managers and entrepreneurs or creatives and more kind of technicians in that way? Yeah, you know, I hadn't really thought about it in that way. And it, it's hard to say for sure, because we're talking about each set as if they exist in a vacuum, you know, but then you pair them yeah. with other <laughs> things. Um, so if it existed in a vacuum, it might be like, yeah, sensing would be really preferable for a manager. And then um, mm. intuition might be really preferable for an entrepreneur. But the thing that I love about Myers-Briggs is that when you mix them with other preferences in that four letter type code, it might mean like, oh, maybe I look like I'm engineered uh, or designed to be a manager, say, but actually uh, the way that I flex all of my things and the, the with combining who I naturally am and what my tendencies are with the things I've learned and what I'm passionate about. And there are all these other things, right, that go into who we are and what we like to do. Um, maybe I can be a very successful entrepreneur, even if it looks like I'm yeah. designed to be uh, in a management role. So when I think about when Sorry, I think about intuition, it, it normally strikes me as like a, 
like a uh, uh, what is the word premonition? Is that kind of like the same thing? I have a feeling. I have this. Mm -hmm. I feel as if this is true, or I feel as if this is possible, and I'm not so much gauging it based off of uh, of like measurable quantifiable data, but it's more so a hunch. My wisdom, my knowledge, more so is coming yeah. out of me instead of going into me. Yes. Yeah, so this is. Um... I, sometimes I use uh, an example of like, you know, those, there are some TV shows out there where it's like the cop is paired with the psychic, you know, and they, they work on mm. a case together, say. And so mm. the cop would maybe have that sensing preference of A plus B plus C equals D, right? Because they're, they're taking the evidence, they're putting all the pieces together, and then they're look, putting it all together and seeing the big picture. Whereas the psychic might just go, I just know I'm putting all these, my intuition, my gut feeling, all these things, I'm putting them together, what I've gathered, patterns I'm sensing, and this is the person who did it. But then they still mm. have to work backwards and prove. So they might come to the same conclusion, but they come at it from different yeah. angles. And then they they need each other again um, to, to verify things, uh, bounce things off of each other, and to really make a strong case. So... Um, yeah, so that there's definitely an, an element of that. And some people use their intuition. Uh, this is making it more, this is like stepping into like step two stuff with Myers-Briggs. It gets a little more complicated, but um, some people have intuition that's outwardly focused or inwardly focused. So like you said, some people might have an <laughs> internal thing like, oh yeah, I definitely um, I'm pulling from within myself, this intuition, this premonition, this, this thing that I feel certain about. Um, and then other people, um, are more using their intuition in the way they look at the world outside of them and they might spot patterns and things and then they come to conclusions that are based on their observations um, or the things that mm. they've pulled in. So it's kind of, it can get tricky. Like I said, when we start combining with the other letters, it can look very different because in the end we end up with 16 different combinations of these four preferences I'm talking about or four sets of preferences. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. What's the next one? All right. So the next one is how you make decisions about that information that you took in, how you process it. And so this is uh, T for thinking and F for feeling. So people with the thinking so preference, we, they, oh, go ahead. Just so I'm along with you. So the first category, I and E, is kind of like energy, how you monitor mm -hmm. and what fills your cup and how you respond to uh, like what happens with your energy levels, right? Yeah. Inside or in, uh, introspective ex, or not introspective. Um extrovert introvert the mm -hmm. next one is a little bit more of how you how would you categorize the second one it's a little bit more um, of how you what kind of information that you tend to pay attention to more cool cool gotcha mm -hmm. what's arriving in your in your uh inbox right and where yes. it's coming from and then the yes. third one is how you make decisions about that yes yeah so you've okay. pulled in this information you've either pulled in um sort of like data facts figures, you know, the this is what is kind of stuff, or maybe you've pulled in more patterns and observations and theories and things like that. And then you make decisions about that. So mm. um, the, with the thinking preference, these are people who want to be as objective as possible. They want to focus on cause, effect, pro, con. Um, they want to really lay things out. They like, they're, they tend to be good with um, processes and things like that. Um, people with the feeling preference, instead of stepping outside of a situation, they kind of want to step into it and use their empathy, try to understand um, the, the people element, especially. So people with the thinking preference also care about people. It doesn't mean that they're you know, cold and, and unfeeling at all. Um, it just means that they bring this logical approach to things. And then the um, feeling preference, it's not that they don't see the facts and figures or the data. It's that the thing that has the most pull for them is how are things going to affect people? You know, that is like, I, when I think about uh, most people's dads, I think about thinking, mm. you know, let's, let's be cold and calculated with this approach and let's, let's not get too feely with it. I don't, you know, mm. there's like a, I think a pressure, especially for men, a lot of times to be very um, cold emotionally and not lean on feeling. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really cool, which is coming up as we're talking about this is I'm seeing my own, like how I'm responding to the information you're telling me is I'm seeing my own um, biases towards one side or the other based off of the messages I've internalized over the, just my years as an, as oh, a human. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and it's this, funny yeah. how like, it's funny how like even just the first reaction I might have is that one of these is better than the other. You should, right. you should be one versus the other. 
uh, this is a mm-hmm. nice little this is a nice little uh, exercise of sorts just to get all your bullshit out and say, look, there's different ways to do this, homeboy. So yes. let's open our mind a little bit and realize the value in all of them. Ah, that makes me so happy. That's why I love this. Um, I because I think I think I came at it from an angle of like I'm the I'm the youngest of four children. I, um, we think now one of my sisters might be an extrovert, but, um, growing up, it was always my understanding that I was the only extrovert, uh, or only person who preferred extroversion in my family out of the six of us. Um, and there are some combinations that they have that I felt like I should be more like them. And so then when my dad brought home this book explaining all this stuff, it, it was like, oh, I, I'm not, it's not anyone better or worse. It's different. It's, it's what not was the book for someone who might want to read it. Yeah, it was called um, "Please Understand Me Too" um, by David Kiersey. <laughs> um, he, oh, that's so sweet! It's so great, and um, he uh, uses sort of like the framework, um, but he uh, separates things out by temperament into four categories. Um, so it's like four types per four categories, so that for the sixteen types, um, it's very interesting. And it was the my first exposure to this, and I. Um, it was so, so, so validating. And I was reading through my type and I was highlighting mm. everything. I think I was about 13 at the time. And I was highlighting everything and I was like, oh, it's okay to be this way. I'm not wrong. It's just one of, and so I started to see things as more like, oh, it's not like a long rectangular table where the people who have the right ideas and the right way of going about things in life are at the top at the, you know, the head of the table and the rest of us are just trying to be like them. It's more like nights at a round table where everybody has a valid perspective that together creates the whole picture and so that was that's really beautiful thank you that was just like life-changing for me so i love that's why i love sharing these things so let's grab the last letter yes so um oh before i do that i wanted to comment on what you said about um the way that we're raised right so if we're raised in society to be like more you know men should have the thinking preference and women should have the feeling preference well then if you're um a person who doesn't fit what you were being raised uh, or socialized to be like, um, that can be confusing. So a lot of times when people take the assessment, they might go, I don't know which I am. And then we have this discovery process of, well, what were, what were the messages sent in your home, in your yeah. school, in your community? And so it can be re- very validating for people who don't fit what they were expected to fit. And what's funny too, is that like that, f- the phrase, I don't know, I don't know what I am. I don't mm-hmm. know how I, I don't know how I manage my energy. I don't know how I receive information. I don't know how I make decisions. Mm -hmm. I would, my, my like gut reaction to that is you probably do. It's just, if it, if it's not what's celebrated, you probably hit it from your own, you know, your own awareness. Exactly. Exactly. And tried to fit another mold. Exactly. Um, all right. So I want to talk all about that. Yeah, I want to talk all about that. Let's just get these four letters down on paper. Yeah, great. At least for me. <laughs> yes. No, yeah, this is great. We'll lay the foundation. So, so the yeah. um, the last letters are P for perceiving, J for judging. Um, this is how you orient yourself to the world around you. Um, so, mm. um, with the perceiving preference, this is for people who kind of tend to be like, go with the flow. They take things as they come. They can turn on a dime um, and it doesn't necessarily ruffle them, right? Um, but That's someone who's perceiving? Perceiving, yes. Yeah, you're just sort of taking it in and taking in the information. Um, I liken it to, so, so well, let me tell you judging and then I'll give the example. So um, judging, I always wanna say, this does not mean you're judgmental because it can, it can get a bad uh, rep for that. Um, it is just about, being able to make judgments fairly quickly. Um, so they mm. might uh, make decisions. They tend to be, they want to organize the world around them. So they make decisions about the information as it comes in. Whereas the perceiving preference might just take it all in and absorb it um, without yeah. necessarily coming to conclusions or or making a judgment call or decision about so, that information. Someone who's judgmental might want to make decisions so they can label it and say, okay, that goes with this, that goes over here. That way I can organize the information coming in and then yeah, so be the prepared to make decisions. Exactly. So the, so the simple example I use is, you know, if you go into a, a clothing store and you see, um, and this doesn't necessarily always apply because I might, I might not do what I would be expected to do based on this example, but just to, to illustrate. Um, so you walk into a store and they're on the display table with shirts. There are some that are kind of unfolded and laying out, right? Somebody with a perceiving preference might just look at that and go, oh, 
somebody didn't fold their shirt back. They're just taking in the information. They're not necessarily doing anything with it yet. And somebody with a judging preference might go, oh, I want to tidy that because uh, it's, mm. it's, I'm going to make a decision that I want to tidy that and get it back in order. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah. yeah, so that's, that's kind of like how that, we tend to be with approaching situations. Or that person might need to tidy up those shirts before they can decide which shirt they liked. <laughs> Yes. Yes, exactly. So, so yeah, a perceiving person might go in and want to tidy it because they want to take in all the information about what's all there before they make a decision. Um, Mm. Because they they tend to really like to information gather. Um, Another example Mm. is, you know, if um, if you have a deadline for, you know, you're in high school and you have a paper due, um, and you have the deadline. Somebody with a judging preference would probably go, okay, I need to steadily work toward that goal. Um, each week, I'm going to get this much done on the paper. And then by the time it comes here, you know, I'll have it finished before the deadline even maybe. And then the person with mm. the perceiving preference might be gathering information, thinking about, well, what exactly do I want my stance to be on the paper? And, and where am I going to get that information? They might just read a lot about that topic. Maybe they haven't picked a certain topic to focus on yet. Maybe they explore a few. And then when it gets down to crunch time, then they finally make the decision on the topic and kind of race to the end to make it by the deadline. Um, so different so approaches. when I organized this on my paper and in mm-hmm. my mind, I, uh-huh. I, there's en- there's energy, right? There's the way that I, I, I gauge my energy, what fills me up, what drains me. Mm-hmm. Then there's information. It's how mm-hmm. I'm how I receive information about what's going on in the world. Yeah. Does that come from my senses? Does that come from inside my intuition? Mm-hmm. Where am mm-hmm. I getting my info? What do I, how do I make decisions about that information? Either I'm thinking about it and I'm trying to, I'm, I'm very logical and maybe void of, of emotion and, mm-hmm. and maybe even warmth. And, but someone else might be making decisions based on their feelings, where they have, mm-hmm. where they're leaning towards. Maybe it's something that's hard to explain. So energy, information, decision. The last one, I have a hard time putting a word on. I know you said orienting yourself towards the word, or towards, towards the world, yeah. but how, how might else would I make sense of that last one? Let's see. Um, how you how you want your environment, how you let, hmm, how, how would I say this? It's like how you organize the world around you, how you want it to be organized. So that you can receive information and make decisions. Kind of, yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. So now that we have it all out. Yes. Uh, hopefully, uh, if you're listening along with this, this has made sense so far. I've tried to slow it down as much as I need to. Maybe we're on the same pace. Maybe you're a step ahead of me. I don't know. But we've got it all down on paper. I or E, S and N, T and F, and P and J. So mm-hmm. each person can, can begin to organize themselves based on what feels right to them in each category. Yeah. Right? Um, before I, before I go off on a tangent, anything you want to add to this or talk about? I'm just curious where you want to take it. Cause there are so many directions okay. I could go. Yeah. <laughs> Here's our mission in taking this. I like the, I like the thread or the, the vein of validation. I like that. That, that seems to be something really, really important as a part of this conversation. Mm-hmm. And I think that this might be a really validating conversation for a lot of people, just like you described when you found that book called mm-hmm. please understand me too. Such a cute yes. name, by the way. Yeah. Um, my question to you, Caitlin, mm-hmm. is what set, what is like, you know, ENFJ or ENTP, what, what, what do you call that tag or a label? What was the name of it? Your type code, or your four letter code. Yeah, yeah, your type. Okay. What type does our American culture praise? Good question. Um, okay. So um, we'll work through it step by step. So this will kind of be a good um example for people who are letting all this turn in over in their heads. Um, Okay. So the first one, what would your instinct tell you about whether American culture values extroversion or celebrates extroversion or introversion more? Extroversion. Definitely. Yeah. Um, And then sensing or intuition um, that like very practical grounded in reality or the more dreamy theoretical of intuition. Sensing. Like yes. grounded in re- grounded in reality, objectivity, yes. objectivity, yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> objective titty. Sorry, I said objective titty. My bad. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm trying. That's so good. You're getting, you're getting it. You're getting it. Mm. Uh, all right. And then um, thinking or feeling, having that objective, logical approach, or the more um, like empathetic, step into it approach. You don't even have to answer that one. Right. I think yeah. thinking. Obviously thinking. Yes. Right. Yes. So we're at E. 
for extroversion, S for sensing, T for thinking. And then would we value more the go with the flow or the organized kind of more routine uh, decision making? Mm, mm. I think we're going with J on this. I think America yes. is sitting at an ESTJ. Yes. Yes. So ESTJs um, tend to, it would be like if we're going to look at a, if we were to look at a drawing of a textbook ESTJ, but obviously there are always going to be people who go in and out of the, or you know, things do or don't apply to them and they have these preferences. But um, an ESTJ um, would tend to, they really love engaging with people. They're energized by people. They tend to be very practical. They tend to be good with routine processes. Um, you might often see them in management roles. Um, because they're very good at interacting with people. Um, they're also able to make some of those tough decisions that might be more challenging for somebody with, say, the feeling preference to have to make in business. ESTJ? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So so this is um, when you think about America and, and how, uh, or the United States of America, and we, we focus a lot on success and getting ahead and being um, being able to make those tough calls and being able to make big decisions and be in charge of things. Um, ESTJs are very good at all those things. And so it's a mm. very, um, yeah, like a, a, a portrait of what you might imagine if, if it were the U S personified. It's funny. There's a, there's like a little bit of, uh, of like tone or association that I s sense when you say, when you, when you're talking about them mm -hmm. and it sounds like these are the important people, these are the people that are in charge. And it's funny how like our association of, of like in America with where we are, um, you know, raised on capitalism and have made a lot of innovation through capitalism, but uh, also there's a lot of negative things about it, but it's interesting how in our, in our culture, those people are the important people. That's how we perceive them. It's the people that have real things that they're working on. They have their, they're the people that are, uh, like we're talking about, kind of we're biased towards them. We see them as being the right ones. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They very much like I've all I've had a lot of um, people I know with the ESTJ preferences who have looked up to a lot. They have a lot. I have a lot to learn from them because I don't have a lot of letters in common with them in my own type code. And so um, it's I admire a lot of things about them. And and then also I think it's important is just a, a caveat for me to throw in here in general about uh, the all the types is that the types and the preferences, they're all like neutral, you know, it's, um, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. really what you do with it. So you could have any type, you could even have the, uh, a type that sounds like they'd be the, the sweetest, most empathetic person in the world, but they could, <sighs> if they want to use it for evil, they can use it for evil. If they want to use it for good, they can use it for good. You know, it really just depends. Um, Absolutely. and so, so no, I want to just, uh, use this opportunity to say that no type, I very strongly believe no type is good or bad inherently. It's all just what somebody does with their preferences. Um, so absolutely, you can have an ESTJ who's like maybe in charge of a company and they're super philanthropic and they do great things, or you could have somebody and just like capitalism, like it can go this way or that way, right? And it just kind of uh, depends what where you focus your energy and and your time and attention. And so that really goes for any type too. Hmm. ESTJ the interesting thing that I think about with this is that like we're talking about self-awareness here in a large regard we're talking about the the wonderful wonderful um asset of knowing yourself well mm -hmm. knowing how you function and knowing how you relate to you know the information around you how you make decisions understanding it from a neutral sense um what I think is interesting about this that I would want to encourage people listening to this conversation to consider is that when you go through these, you might, you might say I'm one of these or the other because you, you don't want to be the other one. And, mm -hmm. and like, you're, you are the other one. You're mm -hmm. the, like, that's who you are. I feel like it just like this is, it's just interesting. Cause to me, it brings up a lot of the, like part of our social, uh, sorry, part of our uh, conditioning, is is disconnecting us from the parts of us that influence us to be other than the desired which is mm -hmm. in this case estj you know mm -hmm. um when you're on that journey of self-discovery i just want to encourage the listeners to open up enough space to 
kind of shake off some of those biases and really go about this in a neutral way to say like, it, no, it's just about learning how I function. Even if my culture, even if my family, even if my group of friends doesn't value the, the things that someone like me values, that's okay. Yeah. 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 And, um, yeah, and it, it goes every way, which way, right? It's, it's, um, because you might take, uh, in somebody with ESTJ preferences and if they grew up in a family that, that more valued say feeling or introversion or things like that, they might not feel like they're at an advantage necessarily living in the United States if that's where they're mm. living. Um, so, so there are all these layers, right. Of the way that we're conditioned. We have, um, the societal one, like what does it take to be successful in this society overall? And then we've got whatever particular area you live in, the school you went to, your immediate family, all these things. So sometimes it can be difficult um, as people try to work out why do I feel like maybe a black sheep or, you know, or the, the outlier or whatever here? Um, why do I feel that way? Um, and so people of all different types can feel that way. To, and so then they can start break, people can start breaking down where are the messages that I got that were really strong for me that made me yeah. feel like maybe how I am is wrong or, yeah. or that it should be different. Yeah. Maybe we could uh, put some, some words and some talking time into the opposite, maybe the shadow of this ESTJ of the American culture and maybe talk about some of the benefits of INFP. Yeah. So INFP, um, I actually have a, um, if anyone's interested, I wrote an article about uh, ENFPs and INFPs, kind of what they bring to the workplace, because a lot of times these types can feel like they don't fit in in the U.S. Uh, workplace and or they, they feel mm. like maybe their talents are not as visible. Um, so it's harder to quantify. Um, so I wrote an article about like, I think it was five things that um, that people can kind of feel good about and celebrate about themselves if they have these preferences. So um, mm. INFPs, so they tend to be um, quite creative, uh, maybe philosophical. Um, they tend to go with the flow. They might feel, they, they might take some more time to process things um, because they, they use their feeling to process and make decisions. And they do that in this internal way where they go through everything. Yeah, and that's okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, like one of the things that I talk about when I do workshops and everything is how can we set up the workplace to be good for everyone? So if introverted um, preference people tend to have um, may, maybe need a little more processing time to come to their conclusions um, because they really want to turn everything over. Maybe they aren't quick to say out what they're thinking. Well, before we have a meeting, it doesn't hurt those with extroversion to have an agenda beforehand, but it could really help people with introversion and they can start formulating mm. those thoughts and processing before. So trying to create that level playing field for people. Um, yeah. So yeah. Real quick, if you wouldn't mind, yeah. just a short break. I'm going to use the restroom real quick and then we'll come right sure. back to this. I'd love to continue the conversation at mm -hmm. that point. Uh, INFPs, let's talk about just more of, let's let's give some good space and some good conversation to the people, INFPs out there in the world who are listening to this yeah. saying, what about me? What about me? We're back. Yeah. Thank you. I'm so glad, so grateful for the break. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, nope. of course, no worries at all. There's no rush here. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so INFPs, we yes. live in a culture that values ESTJ. I know that's mm -hmm. true. As we go through these, I can, I can feel as we go through these, my want to like be in the group with E, S, T, and J, the people totally. who are extroverted, people who sense and are objective, people that think through things and don't feel through things, and people who judge things and aren't so passive and maybe open-minded might be a, a word in there. So I, I truly believe what you're saying about neutrality. I truly, truly believe that mm -hmm. the these things exist, these things have come into existence because they're useful. Yes. And because they're a, a, a useful thing, INFPs are kind of the, the I think, people who identify with those individual classifications or even as the whole thing, what's up, we're talking straight to you if you're an INFP, <laughs> yeah. that they might feel a little bit like their skill sets aren't well they might they know that their skill sets aren't as valued by their workplace hence your your uh, mm -hmm. your article that you wrote about it and mm -hmm. just the messages you internalize around you in the world what is the superpower that INFPs have Ooh, INFPs have a few um 
one, they tend to be really good listeners. Um, they really, mm. and, and very empathetic. They tend to have really great ideas. Um, they love to brainstorm. Um, they're quite creative. Um, they can, like I mentioned, one of the superpowers of all those with um, perceiving the perceiving function is um, they can turn on a dime in, in the in the instance. So one time I asked a group of people where they were split between perceiving and judging preferences. I said, can anyone tell me the the superpowers of each of those? And one man raised his hand and he said, well, my wife has a judging preference or my, uh, and, and she, you know, she planned our wedding, every single aspect of it. It would not have happened if she hadn't done that. Right. You know, she, and she had every detail down. He said, but when something would come up at the last second and there was a fire to be put out, she would bring me in and I would help yep. take care of it. Yeah, it's it's so it's so important to really give a voice to both sides of that. I I personally identify a lot with the with the P, with mm-hmm. uh with P baby yeah. pushing P. I identify with the P because I can turn on a dime and I feel really really skilled at being able to think well in chaotic environments mm-hmm. and to come up with solutions quickly. Yeah. The sh- the dark side of that is that because of that I often lack preparation for things that are important because I know so much that I'll be able to, I can, I can be able to wing it. But one thing I've noticed in my life in the last really year or so is that like winging it is cool, but Mm -hmm. preparing beforehand can really help things go a lot more smoothly. And then when things don't go as prepared, then you can wing it. This is exactly. And both sides can learn that from each other, right? So then somebody with a judging preference can learn uh, how to, like, hey, it's great that I prepared this plan, but also my I think everything will go better or more smoothly if I'm okay if there's a last minute change. And so, like, yeah. like you said, having both, having the preparation plus the adaptability is ideal. If we could, you know, if we yeah. can, um, and and maybe those don't always exist within one person. Uh, maybe it's pairing with somebody where, like, in yeah. my instance, the man with his wife, um, pairing with somebody who can help you um, adapt in times where it's difficult to adapt or help you prepare when it's difficult for you to see how should I plot this out. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's really great. So, um, oh, what was I just going to tell you about? It'll so sorry, we were talking about superpowers. We were talking about superpowers of the INFP. Yeah, they're listeners, yeah. They're creative. They can turn on a dime. They're, you know, these things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, they just tend to be um, pretty, it's going to be pretty easygoing. They also, um, however, they have a really strong sense of the, who they are. Um, they have a very strong um, sense of their values, what they care about. And authenticity is very important to them. They want to make sure that they are aligned with whatever they feel on the inside is what how they're behaving on the outside. Almost naturally, because being if you have grown up and you've realized that the world isn't necess- or the culture you're around isn't necessarily rooting for your personality type, then you know you can either shame it and hide it, or you can decide to express it and and then begin to learn authenticity and how important that is in someone's life. Yes, yeah, and you get a really yeah. I'd never thought about that before. How the the element of you become very aware of yourself when it is contrasted by say the the societal expectations um you yeah. become very aware so even even on little things like if your society is saying um you know because of your uh gender identity you should be uh logical and thinking and don't bring any emotions into it or because of you know you shouldn't be so like if if uh i've come across women who have the thinking preference and they've felt like they've been treated as if they are not warm enough or um, Mm. nurturing enough because they're maybe the type of person who can make those objective, difficult to make decisions about things in in business or in life. Um, And so you become very aware of who you are when it's counter to what might be expected of you. Yeah, this might be off topic, but it does come up as a question in my mind, Mm -hmm. the masculine and feminine Mm -hmm. as has inspirations for for being or ways that you express yourself. Do you do you organize? Um, and I would just take this opportunity to say that I don't necessarily organize it based on someone's sex, but based mm-hmm. off of the idea of masculine elements and feminine elements and how those mm-hmm. express themselves in each individual. Mm-hmm. Do you do you see that these cat these um, labelings I E S N T F P J do have do exist somewhere on a spectrum of masculine and feminine or, or not so much? I think some of them could, I'm thinking through them right now. Um, 
I think the thinking and feeling is probably where we see it the most. What's expected, like what's what would be categorized as masculine versus categorized as feminine. Um, but even that, it's like, sorry to interrupt you. No, no, go ahead. Even that is interesting because I one of the, like, we could just hang out in this ballpark because I think this is an interesting little caveat mm-hmm. the conversation. TNF thinking and feeling, right? Mm-hmm. We we would you would tend to you would tend to lean and say thinking is masculine and feeling is feminine. I heard someone describe masculinity one time as masculinity is the ability to sit presently with any emotion in its entirety. They were borrowing from the idea of more like Eastern, you know, religion of mm-hmm. masculinity represents more the awareness or the, mm-hmm. the space of which life exists and femininity is the is the the actual uh, tangible expression the the continuous flow of expression of life and so masculine is conscious of existence and existence is the feminine and so oh, their whole idea was that like the deepest masculine you could be is like holding space infinite space for for somebody your partner or for a child and they feel mm-hmm. things and that's the thing that i think is the the shitty part where we go like, oh, you should be a thinker. Well, like I've met a ton of fucking guys who really value themselves as a thinker and you can't go off feelings and watch them fumble moments with people who really, really care about their connection with them because they have zero capacity to experience feelings. Yeah. Yes. And, and I feel, I, yeah, I love this. I love the, um, I think, I think there is what we've always seen as traditionally masculine, traditionally feminine, and then maybe what a better definition of it would be. And I love the one that you just shared. Um, and I, I think, uh, yeah, the other thing that's interesting. So, so when I was studying to be a, a therapist for a couple of years before I went the coaching route, um, I did two years in this I remember we talked about that. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it, I learned a lot. It, it has it greatly transformed my life, the, all the courses I took in those two years, because I took, um, one of the last courses I took was couples counseling, which was huge. And I use it in all dynamics, not any one-on-one dynamic, not just um, between two people who are romantically involved. I think it's all relevant. Um, and the, the thing, one thing I learned was that, um, tr- you know, in the past, um, maybe not as much in modern day, but still exists. Um, women were taught that to, to stifle emotions of anger or frustration. Um, so that a lot of times the, the, and, but they were taught like sadness and all that's okay to express. So a lot of times when a woman is angry, she will cry and yeah, she'll trans transmute it to something that's acceptable. Yes. And then it'll be the same for men. So if they were taught, no, you boys don't cry. Um, but anger is okay. Anger is still an emotion, right? And so when they're Hell sad, yeah. they may come out as anger. Um, mm. And so a lot of times, you know, when people talk about, like, I see the little funny memes, like anytime that, uh, like, there were two men in some, I don't, I don't know if it was the House or Senate that were um, just this week, there was a, a, a news story where they're talking about fighting each other and, you know, getting emotional. And then I saw comments of women joking, oh, but they say women are too emotional because we forget mm-hmm. sometimes that that anger and all that is also emotion. You know, it's not just yeah. sadness isn't the only thing. And, um, and so like, I like that idea of true masculinity and I think femininity too would apply that to be able to sit with any, any and every emotion and be able to process it and express it in a way that um is like healthy and um yeah you know can be how do I, in, in an effective productive way it could be expressed yeah without without these weird little tags on it that say like you can only express so much or mm-hmm. from a from a therapist perspective or from a really effective partner listening perspective you can only allow so much you know you can only allow someone to express so much because if you're mm-hmm. like you know, I have to control to make sure people don't, you know, act out of line instead of mm-hmm. allowing people to show up in their entirety as feeling extremely angry. You know, mm-hmm. like that's where we that's where I think a lot of a lot of people who over identify with trying to appear masculine mm-hmm. will stifle emotions in the room, you know, because that's they what don't feel comfortable them, right? with them. 
their mm-hmm. emotions were stifled and that's what they learned. And then that's what they turn around and do to other people. And so it's on, on the one hand, I have as frustrating as that uh, characteristic can be to people around them. I also have empathy for them that for mm-hmm. whatever reason, whether it was family or society that they ended up operating that way, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. Yeah. Before we lose it in the river, uh, INFP yeah. superpowers, we've got listeners, they're creative, they can mm-hmm. turn on a dime. Anything else you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I just think they can, they're very good at, um, being present and letting things flow. And I think that that's really, um, really valuable when you think about a friend who just lets you be who you are <laughs> and yeah, just yeah, 100%. You, takes it and doesn't try to shape you or change you. I think, um, I think that's really valuable. There's a lot of, there's like a, in my mind, it, it, there's a lot of soul with someone who, with, with not just somebody, but with the um, expressions of self that are I and F and P mm-hmm. it, because there's, it's um, like when I think about extroversion, I think about mm-hmm. social hierarchies and kind of playing the game. When I think about sensing, I think about objectivity. When I think about thinking mm-hmm. and decision-making, I think about very cold rationale and even the underside of each one of those intuitive, uh, I'm sorry, uh, intro in introverted, mm-hmm. intuitive, and feeling. Mm-hmm. There's a, like a, I just, personally, I just sense a lot more depth to those. Mm-hmm. There's a, there's like a lot of use and the depth that they, that they bring to the moment. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I'm, I'm inclined to say two things are true. Well, Cause I, I just want to make sure not to go the opposite direction from the U S and, and, uh, show favor for one over the other, you know? Um, but, yeah. but it, so this is what's challenging, right. To, to provide validation, uh, to maybe one set of people and all those different preferences that might be different than, than the U S, um, kind of the, the celebrated, uh, combination of traits, right. And also not, um, disparage anyone who might not, not that you're doing that, but I just want to make sure I don't as, um, as a, as a practitioner. No, that was the, that was the last note was I was going to say, let's spend 30 minutes disparaging the group of, e- <laughs> no, <I'm joking. laughs> I have that written down as a checkbox moment. ESTJ disparage. Yeah. Do you want to get started on that now? Or do you? Well, <laughs> say that I, I I only say that because I have to be careful it is it is something that I've had to work so hard at um to do what I do because part of anyone's journey who may not have some of those traits is you might take a hard left for a while and go yeah mine are awesome theirs aren't so awesome you know and and yeah. and go on that journey and then it's then it's hard to then you have to like swing yourself back into an equilibrium with um realizing okay now that I've had my moment and really strongly validated um, who I am, how I operate, um, can I now challenge myself to see the value in them the way I always yeah. would hope they would see the value in me? That's right. That's exactly right. That is, yeah. that is healing. That is growing. That's, that's taking responsibility and deciding the buck stops here with you. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because it, it can be tempting I've been there. It can be like very tempting to. Well, um, yeah. At, yeah. At first you're a victim, you know, at first you're a victim. At first you're a victim of yes. the treatment yeah. that you went through and you say, fuck these people and they should be beaten, you know? And then, <laughs> and then you go and then you, and then you're like, well, here I am wielding the same weapons that they did to me. And exactly. I don't know if I want to do that. Yeah. Exactly. I had a therapy session uh, the other day going through some, some uh, difficult trauma stuff from, childhood and there was this pent up anger Mm -hmm. that i had towards this towards these people and um and so my therapist walked me through really really saying what what did they make you feel right Mm -hmm. what is what was the pain that they caused that pissed you off so bad Mm -hmm. and so i you know i listed them off and they made me feel this way and they did this to me and they made me think that I blah, 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 all this stuff and all this anger, you know, builds up in my chest. And, um, and then he's, you know, we're doing this with my eyes closed and he says, uh, you know, all right, I'm going to give you one last little thing to think about here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, this may hurt. And I was like, you know, Mm -hmm. what, 
you know, and he says, um, you know, because it's all about how they, how, what they made you think you had to be and what they made you think you were supposed to be and all this kind of mm-hmm. stuff. And uh, he said, um, here it is. You didn't have to believe them. And I just deflated. And I was like, God damn it. You know what? Oh, you know, <laughs> yeah. you're right. I didn't, I didn't have, I didn't have to believe them. I agreed with them. I adopted the messages. I took it in and then I, I beat myself for the ways that they treated me. Mm-hmm. And that was so empowering. And it was like a small little adjustment from yeah. v- anger, from victimhood to re-empowering that person who went through that and says, oh, you didn't have to believe that you were worse off because you didn't express the personality traits that other people have. Mm-hmm. They, you accept, you believed it. You accepted it. You started yeah. the torment for yourself. Oh, you wow. Know? Yeah. That, it's so hard to find the balance or like the line between where did somebody else's behavior and my like the two sets of responsibility in any situation like where do they begin and end and it gets complicated too right by like well what was the relationship dynamic did they have more power in that relationship all those different things that that can get so so tricky and and i think like there's that journey that i think maybe we all have to go through though like you said like go to the place where you embrace the part of you that that felt hurt and that you were wronged and embrace that and let yourself have all of those feelings and work through all of that. And then, and, I, and then I think only then might you be able to then be open to listening to a question like that. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and then, it- and then it can be empowering after a certain point, right. Once you've worked through certain feelings about it. Yeah. You definitely can't skip steps It almost like you, you know, it's almost like you and I like, you know, don't listen to me. If this is your uh, only therapy source, please don't. But, (laughs) you know, like in my mind, you almost like, yeah, you got to be angry because you were hurt. So, you know, get angry, get angry, Mm -hmm. express that fucking pent up rage and and frustration and get it up. So you feel it and you feel all this thing and then feel it until it feels so heavy and it feels like a liability that you're having to lug around this defense, Mm. this shield. And then at that point you can say, okay, you know, you felt it, you got your armor, you got your defense and you, you know, you're protected, but you know, now, you know, you have a new problem, which is this, this anger is so heavy to lug around, you Mm. know, now what's the next step? Maybe the next step is to to try the route of uh, personal empowerment where you say like, okay, you know, maybe there's a route. And I'm with you on that. Like it's hard, Mm -hmm. especially from childhood. You say like, well, at what age was it their fault? And what age was it your fault? And I don't really know the answer to that question, honestly. I just know that the way that I feel, the way that I feel shifts to empowerment when I assume the responsibility. And I had to go through the anger period before I even could consider assuming the fucking responsibility. Fuck them. It's not my fault. Fuck them. You know? Mm -hmm. But after a while, it was like, you know what? This anger is getting heavy. I need to do something else with it. So yeah. that was my journey. Um, yeah, but- and it all depends, right? It depends what the, just like a caveat for anyone listening who might relate to what you're saying or to what I'm saying, like that there are spectrums of things too, right? Like when it becomes abuse or when it becomes like, there's like certain family dynamics and then there are things that are abusive and then there are, th- and so it's obviously the healing journey is going to look very different depending on the degree to which um, yes. someone caused you harm, right? So it's going to, yeah, yes. it's always going to be different. Uh, Please get professional help. Please don't listen to Braxton and Caitlin tell you how to live yes. your life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mean, speaking briefly, but I am not licensed. I, that is not, ah. not my thing. Yeah, that's yeah. so funny. Here's Braxton and an almost therapist telling you how to live your life. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, please don't. Please don't. Yeah, mm. and yeah. Uh, I'm all for like take what 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 works and leave what doesn't. You know, when I, whenever you're listening to anything, yeah. it's like the buffet. So if something resonates, great. And if it doesn't, say. Nah, forget those people. I don't agree with what they're saying. I'm going to do my thing. I think that's empowering yeah. too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I have here written down on my uh, piece of paper that, uh, well, I have horrible handwriting, so I know what it says, but I don't know exactly what it says. <laughs> something, along the, something along the lines of uh, you have to give yourself space um, to accept how you are to then find your superpower and express it. Like yes. this, uh, if there's anything that I hope this conversation has done for listeners and viewers is is to validate just like you said that it made you feel when you found that book validate Mm -hmm. the way you act and and please please listen please hear me and hear caitlin and i think i speak for us both when we say that these these labels these categorizations aren't 
good or bad. There, there it's complete neutrality. This is just yeah. the ways that you can be. And and hell yeah, man. Like these are the ways you can express yourself and ways you can interpret information. And all of these are useful. And if anything, if anything, see if you can't turn your attention inwards and and in the name of self awareness and self discovery, find your own biases find where you might be limiting yourself from understanding how you really operate therefore not being able to tap into some of your own personal power and your natural skill because of the the ways you think you should be mm -hmm. yes yeah i i heard at one point so i i'm got a certification also in the gallup clifton strengths assessment and um one of the things that one of the examples that gallup uses is um you know, if you think about uh, a team or a family or anything like that as a a pizza or a pie or whatever um a lot of times we've been taught to believe that we should be well-rounded in and of ourselves but um like as far as gallup with their clifton strikes assessment their view is sort of no we should all just be who we are and really like lean into our strengths and what makes us who we are and that kind of makes us maybe like sharp like a piece of pizza and when you're put together with yeah. other pieces that's what creates this well-roundedness and like that's why i think that's what i think is so beautiful about um, everyone just kind of owning and appreciating who they are. And um, and it doesn't mean that we don't have to ever work on ourselves because I love my two biggest things in life are personal growth and relationships. So that's why I love these assessments. I think it helps with both because, um, for instance, like if I need to get something done at work and I were to say, oh, well, with my personality type preferences, that doesn't seem like something someone like me would do, but maybe it's like <laughs> my job and I have to do the task. And that's what I'm for. Well, so then I can look at my, my personality and go, okay, given that this is how I'm naturally wired, that can explain why this might feel challenging to me, but yeah. I have to find a way to be able to use who I am to accomplish this, this, thing. you know, assuming it's a moral neutral, just a random task that, you know, it maybe sure. isn't fun, right. Um, an administrative task that isn't, super enjoyable for everybody or something. Um, but yeah, I think I, I think what's really cool about this and, and kind of like I said a minute ago with really needing to let yourself sit in that space of validating who you are and working through how it might've been challenging to be told or gotten received messages, whether subtle or um, overt about how we should be different. Um, I think what I would recommend to anybody who looks into their assessment, what worked really well for me um, this may not be the best way for everyone to go about it, but worked really well for me was to really read about my type a lot, get to know it really, really well, um, feel kind of excited about it in a way that I hadn't been before I learned it. And then I started to learn all the others. And then I had this empathy for everyone else who was different than I am, where I thought, mm. this is so who I am. This one of 16 is so me. I so identify with it. And I have to remember that that's how everyone else feels about their mm. uh, set of, of preferences. And so yeah. that helped me get to a place of, I can stand strong in who I am and I can have this respect for who they are and how they are. And then you can get, then you can really get uh, on with it. You can get on with your life from yep. a place of being validated and respecting others. Mm -hmm. And then the, then the play can start. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it really helps like going back to what we said at the beginning about not taking things personally. Um, like sometimes they might be, but like I said, like most of the time it's, you know, uh, so much of what we do in life is projection. And so if somebody were to interact with me and um, I was getting a sense of that old, oh, I should be different. Um, I can then look at it and go, oh, well, that makes sense because from their lens, they value X, Y, Z and I don't embody that. Yeah. And so maybe they think I should, but that's okay. That's why we each have a place here in this family or in this workplace because they have their role and I have mine and we both bring different things. And it really yep. helps with not taking it personally and seeing it more as yeah. just a dynamic that is going to exist between two people with opposing preferences maybe. Yeah, 100%. Not duh, you value that more. That's how you're made up. That's how you function. It's not how I function. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. There's a... Um, a small little personal breakthrough that um, maybe it's not small, it's seemed pretty significant for me, but um, a mm -hmm. personal breakthrough that I had, um, I'd say maybe nine months ago to a year as I was divorcing in a large way the, the fantasy of the American dream and becoming somebody of significance and success mm -hmm. so that I could feel validated by the world around me. Yep. And uh, the... Th 
the the phrase you know what I see in my head is this like you know like this uh, this character saying like you can you can be anything you know in America you can be anything and it always makes you dream of something you could become and the way yeah. my brain kind of circled back to it after a while was you could be anything even just yourself yes I love that yes I go back and forth with that stuff all the time I grew up I wanted to be an actress I wanted to be a philanthropist I wanted to like I really wanted to be somebody you know and yeah and um and I go back and forth between, like I said, I love personal growth. I also love personal acceptance and other acceptance. Um, and so it's mm. it's this dance in life, I think, between um, challenging ourselves, working on ourselves, striving for certain things that might interest us, and also then going, oh, wait, but I also need to enjoy the journey of it. I need to be present yeah. in whatever I'm doing and, and, um, and realizing that there's so much joy to be found in just being like you said just being yourself not necessarily um because i i was watching clips from the interview you just posted recently i uh, was it dr daniel z is that he's talking about dr. that dr daniel z Lieber, yep yeah that mm -hmm. that um that when you get that that dopamine is like typically in the moment before you reach the thing that you're striving for yeah, yeah. you get it and then uh, and so i always think about um uh i guess jim Jim Carrey, who said, I wish something to the extent of, I wish everyone could get rich and famous so they could know it's not the answer. Um, mm. And I try to really, I try to really learn from others who have had experiences that I haven't. And so I try, I think about that often and, and, um, and we can have that thing in our heads, right? Like, oh, am I settling or am I finding contentment? Because actually contentment is super hard to find. Contentment is elusive. <laughs> so um, I don't mm. know. It's, it's this, um, it's it's a back and forth dance and balance for me of of just trying to find that what I'm hoping for when I get to that place or maybe as maybe more as a kid what I was hoping to get that you know be known and be somebody and like instead say well how can I have that feeling right now how can I yeah. enjoy that right now do I need that thing to feel that way it's hard to it's uh it takes a lot of self-reflection to ask yourself if the thing you want to be is just if if the thing you want to become is just something that's celebrated it's just so you mm -hmm. can feel seen you know hey, hey. <laughs> hey buddy <laughs> yes yes <laughs> you're gonna have to go ask daddy for those okay thank you wait go, go down to the bye bud bye buddy go with daddy and shut the door on the way out, please. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. They were instructed and to stay emerging. upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> emerging stage left, a midget. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My little guy. Oh, sorry. I don't know if you're able to get yeah. it. <laughs> <But laughs> yeah, that's totally fine. Um, yeah, we. it's hard to know if what you want to become is just the thing you think you're supposed to be so you can get the recognition and validation you, f you feel like you lacked out on. Yes. And, and you know what? Funny you say that. Cause I actually think that the more and more I've worked on that, um, that piece of just being, finding happiness and acceptance in who I am and what I'm doing, um, the, the, the less of the, that desire weakens in me. Yeah, I know. I, I had a, a huge fear for, a, for a while. I don't think that I really have it now, it, but it was, um, like if, like if I fuck if fuck if I heal if I heal from mm -hmm. this throbbing need to be significant will I will I have any of the motivation and drive that I've had for so many years? Mm -hmm. And uh, the answer was, uh, you don't I don't not really you won't I mean not really because <laughs> mm -hmm. because you you know you need you fucking need it you needed to to be seen you fucking mm -hmm. needed to be seen you needed people to to think you were the man and you needed to feel to feel uh powerful and strong and validated you need to be seen that's like the mm -hmm. you know the the wound of the young boy you know it's yeah. like you just need people to see you and um yeah, that's one. That's the difficult. That's one of the. That's that has been somewhat of a night of dark night of the soul of sorts for me. Is mm -hmm. is like, uh, okay, well, you know, 
I'm, I feel a lot better when I process the pain of not feeling mm-hmm. significant and not feeling seen. I mm-hmm. feel better inside. I feel like I arrive at the place inside that I thought waited on the other side of achievement and validation. So maybe this is a cheat code of sorts. And then mm-hmm. what I've noticed, I talked to a, um, a gentleman, Jordan Candelish on this podcast the other day mm-hmm. about healing masculine wounds and uh, mm-hmm. it was about being, it, you, you're able to show up. This is how I feel, truly it's how I feel. I feel a lot less motivated and a lot less like bursting with energy for the future, but I, I have this slow, slow burning um, sense of, of like patient optimism and drive towards the mm-hmm. future. Mm-hmm. And the projects I'm working on are, feel like they finally have the time to come into their own instead yeah. of me trying to shake them for all the, the, the significance and, and validation and, and dopamine that I can, yeah. which is really, really cool. I hope that in the next two decades or so that I'll be able to, um, to discover a way of working and achieving and leading that sides more with vulnerability than it does with trying to posture yourself as being someone who's really awesome and successful because that's what you need so bad. I love that. I, yeah, I was just going to say, so for me, um, I think that desire to be seen and understood and all of that, I think the way that I've channeled that is try to help other people feel that way, um, which I, th- mm. I think is common, right? We try to give what what we, we um, need. Are, yeah. And, um, and so the more I've been able to do that and help people, the more I've found a lot of contentment. Um, it's it's kind of like a mutually beneficial situation, right? And that, so I was going to say for you, um, it seems it seems to me like even you know through doing your podcast and everything and in what you do in your day to day too that it's helping people achieve a lot of the same things that um, this is what it seems to me. Correct me if I'm wrong. It seems like you're helping people achieve what you, what you want for yourself too. And that do you? Th- it, it seems like you just said it's instead of being this raging fire, maybe it's more that slow burning but eternal flame kind of situation where that it, mm-hmm. that's just in you to want to do those things, but maybe, maybe when you had that need for validation and all of that, that was fueling it, it was this raging fire, but instead it calmed down. So it didn't necessarily change your desire to have a purpose and make impact and, and fulfill potential, but it just maybe shifted into a, a way that was more sustainable for you. Yeah, absolutely. It shifted into a way of being instead of a way of trying to be perceived by other people. Mm hmm. Yeah. And it, it's so much better. It's so much less occupied. My mind, my mind just spends so much less time now occupied with how what I'm doing comes across to somebody else. Mm-hmm. You know, it's so much more about, uh, I don't know, my days are just a lot more quieter now. You know, mm-hmm. they're a lot more quieter, which is really awesome. Right. And and you're exactly right with the something along the lines of being sustainable. Mm-hmm. It feels sustainable. It feels like delayed gratification. It feels like... I don't know. It just feels like once you're like, if, if you feel okay, Mm -hmm. then what, then the projects you start to work on are feel like they're birthed out of a sincere desire to, to do something useful with your time. Yeah. Instead of, instead of this thing that you think, Oh, if I could get, you know, 10,000 followers on Instagram, then people would think I'm cool. And then if they think I'm cool, I would think they think I'm cool, which would make me think I'm cool. Like, you know, (laughs) like there's the, there's that, there's that, uh, quote that says, uh, 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 you're not who you think you are. Uh, I'm not who I think I am, and I'm not who you think I am. I'm who I think you think I am. Yes, I, that's that's where I get my sense of identity. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. It is. It is. It is really cool, man. That that whole that is that is like the da 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 title of my life for the last three years has been that, and and I have not lost the. I have not lost the connection to mm-hmm. to to energy and source of of flow yeah. but it just is it just looks a lot different it just looks a lot different I love that and and I think like what you just said instead of I'm um, you know instead of being who we think people think we are um, that's what I love about all this assessment work because it's it's a little bit more of this objective way of looking at it and going oh no like I can I can have a strong sense of self that isn't tied to mm. um, what I think people think of me. It's more yeah, wow. really tapping into what do I think of me? Who do I know myself to be? And that doesn't mean we never care what anyone else thinks. Cause like, I think my favorite thing, uh, do you follow Brene Brown much 
uh, do you know her? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely. Figured, I figured you'd find it. Um, in, in, uh, in this one talk that she gave, she talks about that you don't want to, you don't want to necessarily, you don't want to care what everybody thinks, but you don't want to not care what anybody thinks. You want to find the people where it really matters to you, what their, what their opinion and, and is of you and, and what you're doing or your behaviors. So her, her uh, suggestion was to have a one, one inch by one inch piece of paper you carry around with you with the, with the few names of people um, whose opinions <laughs> you really respect and filtering it through yeah. that. Like if they think, if they like somebody, maybe like a mentor, a, a family member who loves you mm. and, um, you know, and if, if they really have your best interest in mind and, 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 or are knowledgeable maybe about the field that you're in or whatever it is, the people you're going to for advice, I want to really take that in and filter that in. And, and that's going to matter to me, but I have to let some of the other stuff roll off my back. Um, that's yeah, been abs to absolutely. And, and to, I had this thought the other day about, I don't know. It was hard to it was hard to categorize whether it was a good thought or a bad thought. But I, I had a thought the other day about like the one of the values uh, and purposes of my existence is to is is like and anyone's not just mm -hmm. mine, but is to is the is impact to other people, the mm -hmm. influence to other people, mm -hmm. and um, you know like one of the things that I've that I've started to learn through this podcast is I started this podcast because I wanted to help people this heroic mm -hmm. desire to help people. I wanted to da, mm -hmm. da, 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 be Logan Paul who does wisdom podcast. I wanted yeah, to be successful yeah. and I wanted to do something significant. And it started to take on the shape of something that was a little bit more grounded and emotional, intelligent and, and with, and this kind of thing. But over the process, I've learned so much. And one of the greatest, one of the things I've really learned is that this podcast is for me. Mm -hmm. This podcast is the conversations that I have work through my soul and help me to heal and to grow. And then I thought like, oh, wait. So when I talk to my best friend in the world, Christian mm -hmm. Lane, what mm -hmm. up, boy? When I talk to my best friend in the world, like when he's expressing to me those difficult things going on in life and he's feeling through stuff and he's having a hard time, like the depth of my own personal wisdom, the depth of my own personal presence Mm -hmm. is the greatest service I could ever give mm. to him. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm doing with the podcast, despite all you wonderful listeners, thank you so much for listening, is continue to work on on me being the best person for that one by one piece of paper with the four or five names that actually matter. Yeah. You know, because I thought yeah. like, you know, someone's going to see this clip on Instagram and they'll be like, oh, that's fucking cool. But it'll be, you know, on the list of a, of a, a thousand, there are three hours a day of screen time they took it and I was just seven seconds of it. Right. The amount of influence is like Paquito. You know, there's nothing yeah. going on there. But the people in your life, your husband, that midget that just walked in the back door, your kid, <laughs> you know, <laughs> my mom. I have breakfast with my mom every Friday for the last seven years, mm -hmm. every Friday. And there's been moments that she's brought out things to me that that were hurting and needed mm -hmm. love. Mm -hmm. And my ability to be present with that pain and to love it and not miss that moment was like the entire world, mm -hmm. you know? And I guess, just, I guess just what I'm trying to say is that like, you know, we try to be, we miss the point. Like the, it's just the people who you have the. It's just the people you have influence on. Period. That you're ever going to make an impact on, yeah. and so that's why it's just like so much more important to be the best person for those few people in your inner circle than trying to reach the whole world with some bullshit, you know, message. Right. Right. And it, and it's like that. That's one thing that. Um, it's like one thing I always work on is like people pleasing. That's been a thing for me mm. my whole life and, and wanting to make sure like I never want to never want to cause harm to anybody, never want to, you know. And, and so sometimes I fear even doing like a podcast interview and he thinks like, oh, surely I'm going to say something that's maybe going to upset somebody or hurt them or whatever. And then and then I have to realize, well, hopefully overall what I'm sharing is really positive. And if that happens, I hope somebody will come to me and tell me and I'll just have to do, I'll have to handle that, that I'm, you know, that I was wrong about something or I could be better and I can improve. Um, and so I have to overcome some of my own ego things 
um, to be able to be of any help to anybody else. Like I have to take that, yeah. like that's the risk that I overcome or, or like that, that or the risk that I take or the, the thing that I'm always trying to overcome in order to put any positivity out into the world. I have to risk the idea that there might be some negativity that comes with that. Um, and something else I need to work on with myself or something. But then I have to remember yeah. I value personal growth. And so that, that that's might it. happen. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. You become an example to others when your friends, family see you make a mistake or hurt someone or do something that you didn't yeah. intend to. And the way you respond to that, you know, like that's the greatest lesson you could ever give. It's much better than being perfect all the time, you know? Yeah, so great. Exactly. I'm glad that you decided to do this podcast with me. And yeah. I'm glad we spent 20 minutes disparaging those damn ESTJs. <laughs> they can go to hell, man. You are not valuable. No, I'm joking. Oh, I'm joking. Love them. I'm, <laughs> we love them. Um, seriously, sincerely, thank you so much for, for joining me for this episode, Caitlin. I really appreciate thank your you time and your expertise on this. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was a wonderful time. <laughs>